Well, you know that we have to discuss today the concept or theory of sovereignty. It is a very important and basic concept in political science and law. Now, the concept of sovereignty, this term, this term in English, it has come from a Latin word, superneas, meaning thereby that is anything which is supreme is called sovereign. So in that connection, sovereignty of the state is discussed in political science as the supreme power of the state. So first it is necessary to know the what is the nature of the supremacy. And certainly the state is not a uh, constant concept. It varies from time to time and it varies at different historical phases. But overall, any constituted political authority is generally called the state. State in relation to the citizens and state in relation to the other states or international field. So naturally, sovereignty, when we talk of internal sovereignty, it means that the relation between the sovereign and the subject or the citizens that is within the country and within the state. And when we talk of uh, international aspect of sovereignty, it means that supreme power of the state vis a -vis the similar power with other states. So in that sense, this term is generally understood in political theory. Let us just have a, some, some preliminary ideas about how sovereignty has been viewed by the experts in politics, political science, jurisprudence, and legal system. First of all, I have just pointed out that it can be internal or external. Now that meaning is quite clear. Internal means so far as the sovereign's authority over the citizens, sovereign's right to claim allegiance or obedience of the citizens or the subject. If it is a monarchical system, the subjects. So uh, internally, all states, what this name is sovereign. If the sovereignty is challenged, then it is a challenge to be tackled by the state. But if in this game, the ruler cannot keep his own sovereign power, then naturally sovereign authority is changed, his character is affected. Secondly, it is sometimes uh, viewed, but the experts have viewed it as and that is a very significant distinction between legal sovereignty and political sovereignty. As the name suggests, as the word has been used, legal sovereignty means sovereignty in the eye of law or sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the interpretation of laws, whether the laws are really framed by the sovereign, is really supreme, has got its full power of allegiance from the people. And naturally, the legal expert jurist, they are more concerned with legal sovereignty. But there uh, sometimes a situation arrives where there is legal sovereignty technically, but uh, the ruler or the sovereign power is not that sovereign. That means a situation may arise I say all these things in order to make the distinction between legal and political. When the challenge comes, so naturally we have to given to understand that the political situation has arisen, which has made this difference. So for example, in the context of a revolution. So when a revolution, in the midst of the revolution, nobody knows where sovereign power is, but in a very strict legal sense, till a decision is arrived at through the revolutionary process, the ruler is the ruler. 
in different phases of history we know that the ruling concept of ruler, concept of rule, concept of sovereign authority, they have changed. For example, in ancient times, naturally, in, as we find in history everywhere, there was the monarch or the king. If we go to the roots of it, how it emerged? Have you got any idea? Yes, to some extent. Well, that monarchy was not a first phenomena. Probably the people had power amongst themselves, they shared the power, but gradually uh, the institution of monarchy came. Someone who used to lead them in battles, in raids, in cattle raids, the leader among them was chosen the monarch. And with the consolidation of mon uh, private property, monarchy was established as a uh, former that's institution. Right, that's right, but even a stage before that, Human beings used to live in tribes. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, can we call it a contract between the people and the... No, no, that's a different, very subsequent stage. Yeah. I'm talking about how it emerged. Emerge. Okay. When there is a, the stage of tribal life, mm. so every, it, no tribe can be organized, organized. without a leader. leader yes. So that is, that is a emergent, that is very inherent in it, mm -hmm. that there must be some sort of a concept of supreme, so, supremacy, mm. who leads. And without this, there will be chaos. Mm -hmm. So organized political life demands the concept of sovereignty. Now if we come uh, to other mm, things that they have, at least theoretician, they do it, the classification. Mm -hmm. So de facto, they say, de facto sovereignty or de jure sovereignty. Mm -hmm. De jure is what I have just said, legal sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Sovereignty as per law. And de facto is as it exists in reality. So now we, what you see, wanted to say that there is a, a large number of people who are sovereign. Yes, in a moment of transition, mm. in a chaotic situation, in revolutionary moments, it happens until a supreme leader has emerged. But those political parties which are very organized, generally they have got a tendency to have some sort of a whether they recognize or not some sort of a supreme leader. Isn't it? That is our mm. experience everywhere. So that depends on the politics of that time. But conceptually, we are talking of concept, we are talking uh, conceptually, there is a de, de jure concept and there is a de facto con concept. You know, just before the proclamation of Queen Victoria, 1858 in our country. Mm -hmm. Now, just before that, who was the sovereign? Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. When the mutiny was going on, mm -hmm. who was the sovereign? There was a de jure sovereign was Bahadur Shah, the last mm -hmm. Mughal emperor. Mm -hmm. He was the r real legal mm -hmm. sovereign of the country. Mm -hmm. But no power, absolutely no power. Mm -hmm. I hope now the conceptually it is quite clear yes, what a de jure yes, and de facto. It is considered that the, all these origins of these concepts like state, sovereignty, etc., they have come from the Western world. Mm. But that is not the fact. I think by this time mm. I have been able to explain that in any organized society, mm. polity or political life means an organized political life, organized community life for a political purpose. And if you say what is political? That means politics is that art which is always trying to find what is acceptable. And if there is nothing acceptable, mm. then the pursuit of ac what is acceptable is the very nature and essence of politics. So that means in case in at the moment of chaos, political chaos, there is no sovereign, clear sovereign. Maybe de jure, maybe somebody else, but not actually, no politically. But when it is settled, stability is restored, then the first thing is, who is the sovereign? Who is the head? Just like a family life, conceptually, there must is a very necessity of who is the leader of the family or the head of the family. So, in the evolution I say that in the history of mankind, in the history of thinking of politics or political science or jurisprudence, Naturally, it has evolved. It didn't mm. come from mm. all of a sudden. Mm. So, we find a reference to this 
in Western thinking. But uh, don't think that there was no such thinking in the Oriental. Mm. In China, in India, in Japan, everywhere, naturally organized life means there is a concept mm. of who is the leader mm. of the community. So approaches differ. So everywhere in the Orient, generally the concept of a divine supreme authority. That is the ruler is there. Ruler is supreme internally vis-a-vis the subjects, but the ruler swears that I rule in the name of God. Mm. More or less, at a certain stage, there was the concept that God is supreme, mm. and this real world we live in, it has has to be a leader, but that leader is a representative of God on earth. To bestow some sort of legitimate character on his rule. Yes in order to lend the legitimacy mm. on what right you are ruling. Because I'm, they claim, that is called the divine origin mm. theory. theory, that is the, I am the representative chosen mm. by God. The first origin of this concept was not in the name of sovereignty as such. Because the ancient period we find that Greek civilization which came first, there Aristotle was the person who systematized the studies of uh, politics, political science, constitution, people, revolution. Before that, his master Plato, he was a basically a philosopher. And he had a concept of a ruler who is supreme but subject to certain conditions mm -hmm. that he must be a very judicious person. He must balance the interest of such and such and such and things. Ideal, you talk of ideal ruler. But in Aristotle we find there is some sort of an attempt to define the state. But he didn't use the word state, they used the word polis in Greek. P-O-L-I-S. Polis is not equivalent to state. Polis, Greek word in its full sense, is society and state mingled with. That together is the joint concept. Mm. When we say poly, Greek polis, mm. city-state, technically mm. city, city translation city. is city-state, city. but it is because of the geographical limitations that within the city they had organized political life. Mm. But conceptually, it was both society and state combined in the concept of polis. So when Aristotle in his politics says that man loses his human character, without living in a polis, that means every person must have an understanding about his place in the polis and naturally his duties vis-a-vis -vis the ruler. Not that ruler is all comprehensive supreme power because there was policy, mm -hmm. a society or included in the polis. But a more refinement come in conceptually during the Roman period, mm. in Roman civilization, I'm not quite sure whether you are aware of it, the most uh, important contribution of entire Roman civilization is the concept of law. It was not there in, in that sense, not there in the Greek civilization. It was Cicero, the only philosopher come jurist, who talked of law, legal system, etc. And subsequently there emerged a group in Roman civilization who are called the lawyers mm. or the jurists, practically those who are talking of theories of law. Mm. So they refined this further. And there it was, clearly now these concepts came, legal and political, legal sovereignty, political sovereignty. So in that sense, we get uh, a advance in Roman time. During the Middle Age, when you come to the Middle Age, between 11th century and 13th century, there was a, among the church fathers, uh, there was intense discussion on it. And they finally came to the conclusion. And the best figure of that time was St. Thomas Aquinas of 13th century. And he formulated a theory of sovereignty. In this sense, he said that sovereignty, now your point that it is one or many or collective. Very clearly, St. Thomas Aquinas said, there are two authorities. 
he used the word end that is purpose what is internal end and what is the general end internal means he means that within the community who wields the power mm. but sub- similarly since they were church fathers they say simultaneously there is another the other world the it they say use the word eternal mm. that is those who are concerned with eternity Etern- mm. they are also authority and in course of time 14th 15th century it was elaborated and given more interpretation this way and that way by many people but more or less the theory of two worlds mm. theory of two powers that concept emerged in connection with sovereignty's concept so when the medieval period for variety of reasons a student of history you know for a variety of reasons medieval period came to an end mm-hmm. and at the end when it was coming to a close we find a remarkable man in political history political thought nicolo machiavelli mm-hmm. but he emerged in a particular political context in italy of his time early 16th century that is small states scattered over northern italy and each state claims that i am the sovereign mm-hmm. and nobody believes the other so an atmosphere an environment of conspiracy disbelief mm-hmm. etc and machiavelli was a statesman he was the advisor to the prince mm-hmm. uh, prince means the ruler in that sense simply so what the ruler should do so that is the point we have to take up in a discussion of from theoretical angle that machiavelli was the champion of the concept of executive sovereign he is not concerned with any other how the prince can be protected how the prince can prosper how the prince can have more power this was his concern and so he said like this that the prince must be fox and the lion at the same time he celebrated statement that by cunning for deliberations anyway he has to retain he has to gain power and retain power by hook or crook but that is why machiavellism has become a phrase in english language mm-hmm. or in everywhere but i think that is an injustice to machiavelli because he wrote another book for his very famous mm-hmm. for this discourses mm-hmm. where we find a completely different machiavelli where he is talking of law he is mm-hmm. talking of what is just mm-hmm. what is talking of individuality everything but typical machiavelli is one mm-hmm. who gave the theory of executive sovereign he didn't bother because that was not the time and that was mm-hmm. not the political condition of legislature or people etc so he was concerned with that but a few years within within uh, 50 years of machiavelli's time we find come across in the 16th century another great figure in france jean boda yeah. he gave a doctrine or theory of sovereignty which is contrary to machiavelli legislative sovereignty because the, that was the compulsion of the time every yeah. thinker every yeah. philosopher thought process emerged from the context of his time that was the time when the french ruler was to negotiate a situation in which the old tradi- medieval traditions are going on divided loyalty charge asserting itself charge having huge property charge was quite powerful in determining the lifestyle of the people including marriage and succession of property everything so people used to look at the charge what we should do but after all there was a monarch there is a king so boda gave his interpretation in terms of sovereignty that sovereignty belongs to the real sovereignty belongs to the legislature the assembly boda was farsighted enough to determine and to emphasize or to notice that the advisers to the king are quite important mm-hmm. so if we again go back to the distinction between legal mm-hmm. and uh, political. political 
So in a political sense, Bodhian concept of sovereignty is political. Mm -hmm. And that is why he is quite famous, because he was a trained uh, uh, jurist, so he know, very clearly he could define what he wanted to say. Buddha uh, accepted one limitation that uh, when he was talking of sovereignty belongs to the king, subject to this uh, so-called assembly. So obviously he was not by term supremacy or sovereignty, he did not mean autocracy, far from it. He meant some sort of a balance. But it should be a clearly understood balance. There is no hodgepodge in Bodhis thinking. He was very, very, very uh, clear what he wanted to say. For example, he said that a ruler's ruling or supremacy or sovereign power is limited. Secular ruler has no jurisdiction. So that is a limitation. Technically, he said the sovereign power is the sovereign throughout the kingdom. But in matters pertaining to religious life, mm -hmm. only that part, the people will be guided by the church, church religious organization. Then he said that uh, in matter of taxation, sovereign is not sovereign. In this sense, mm -hmm. he has to think always in terms of what is tolerable degree of taxation. Mm -hmm. Since I am sovereign, I have got the right to increase taxes and I go on increasing taxes. Mm -hmm. He said, no, that is not the concept of a ruler. Ruler must has got the basic obligation to look after the welfare of the society. Ruler does not mean autocracy, autocrat. So that is so a very interesting thing. And second, and, th and thirdly, Buddha says that there are other interests in society. That is very remarkable. And which was later taken up by that hint, he gave a hint, but that was developed later on by another great French sociologist and philosopher, Matesco, mm -hmm. that what is society? Society is a coexistence of different interest groups. Till now we are mm -hmm. in this tradition because that is the nature of society. This shows that, I am coming to generality, mm -hmm. this shows that there is always a social pressure, mm -hmm. either visible or invisible. And the sensitive ruler must take note of it. Mm -hmm. And so when in sophisticated modern times we find that, for example, in America, Britain, the mm -hmm. developed societies uh, or democracies. So most, most famous example in my mind is Swedish political system. No decision is taken mm -hmm. without consulting the concerned interest. But at the same time, there is one Swedish king, there is a parliament, mm -hmm. there is a cabinet, everything is there. Modern Sweden. But Everybody knows the limit to up to what he goes, all authorities. Mm -hmm. After all, if it is a point of agricultural taxation, for example, mm -hmm. then Swedish Agricultural Association has to be consulted. Without this, it won't be done. So this is this, so this uh, in a vague way, Bodha suggested it, that there are other interests in society mm -hmm. who are also powerful in that sense. So that was the situation and uh, there is a famous commentator, Harnsaw, who was a very, very famous as a author. He said that in Buddha, we find the emphasis on what the sovereign should do. He should do, consult this, he should be this, respect it, to charge, etc. What positively, what the ruler should do, mm. that was the main focus of Buddha. In that way, nature of sovereignty of in the mind of Buddha, we can understand. But uh, there are other commentators like McCoylin and Shepard who said that uh, in Buddha, legal sovereignty's limitations that he indicated, that is most important. That I have just talked about, that there is limitations. Mm -hmm. So to understand the nature of these limitations to the sovereign power, that is the best way to understand Buddha. So in this way, this is the uh, complexities or niceties of 
conceptual analysis the which angle we see a particular problem well after bodhin or bodham we come to a great figure who also contributed in a very major way to the conceptualization of sovereignty and he was thomas hobbes of england now thomas hobbes because of the situation in the mid 17th century england there was civil war going on looking at the civil war he was not a party to it looking at the civil war he derived certain conclusions about the nature of the state and sovereignty that is very important to note that is hobbes took a strict legalist view so legalist view of sovereignty is best represented in that late medieval period by hobbes he uh, analyzes it like this that uh, sovereign power is not circumscribed because of the again i refer to the revolutionary situation chaotic situation of civil war he took the stand if stability is to be restored and stability is the main objective of political life then sovereign hobbes made sovereign completely free he is not circumscribed or limited and his concept of sovereignty it is said that the gobsian sovereignty is unlimited and unlimitable it cannot be limited complete supreme theoretical power he gives to state or the ruler he used the term leviathan mm-hmm. a mythological mm-hmm. f- figure as an animal anyway mm-hmm. most powerful most powerful unlimited no, no question of limiting sovereign mm-hmm. power so what his motive was to create why did he did it, it he as a philosopher mm-hmm. his motive in reference to the context he lived in and wrote mm-hmm. was to restore political order and stability so he gave this theoretical formulation that sovereign power cannot be bargained sovereign power is never separated separable it is cannot be limited or unlimited so we find that sovereign power in hobbes he has got all the rights to govern and no duties except establishing law and order that is the only duty to their people so that is hobbes's contribution and we have to go to the next stage in the next program thank you sir thank you sir